presentation for you today on invasive aquatic plants in Connecticut from uh, Greg Bugby and um, Summer Stebden. And Greg has supported Envirothon for over 10 years now. His presentation is great, and I really hope you guys enjoy it. So take it away, guys. And thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you, Greg and um, Summer, so much for presenting for us. We really appreciate it. All right, I guess I'm on. Uh, thank you for having us. It's always been a pleasure to uh, come to the Envirothons. We're always very impressed at you know the um, you know the, the intensity, if you will, of the participants. How well they're you know they're paying attention and 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 really into what we're saying. And it's just a, such a pleasure to 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 uh, you know be part of it and and, and help them. So today we're talking about invasive aquatic plants in Connecticut. And, you know, when we do the, the live uh, Envirothon for this, we have plants with us in trays and we let you identify them and, you know, feel them and look at them. And, and uh, you know, you're gonna get a little bit, I think a better impression of what they're really like uh, when you do that. But, uh, you know, obviously we can't do that now. And, uh, we're going to use some other techniques to try to get the points across. And in some ways, they might be better. We're going to give more examples of, of what the plants look like in the environment, what they really do, um, rather than, you know, going through uh, detailed taxonomy that would, you know, we often would have like a sort of a, a little quiz at the end for everybody to take to see how many plants they can identify. Um, I'm hoping uh, you all got our email regarding our invasive plant guide. And uh, this is really something you should download because uh, it uh, really is gonna, goes into greater detail of what we're gonna talk about today. It shows you all the plants, talks about you know, where they're located and the harm they do and how you identify them and all that. So this is the uh, Connecticut Invasive Aquatic Plant Clam and Muscle Identification Guide that Summer and I have um, uh, authored. And uh, again, it's downloadable. We're gonna be getting a new, um, a new edition coming out, updated edition, hopefully. But this is something you should have. So when we talk about invasive plants, uh, hopefully you realize what that term means for invasive organisms of any kind. Uh, it, from our perspective, an invasive organism or an invasive aquatic plant is and from what we're, we're working with today is a plant which is not native to the state. Uh, the ones that you hear those most about are those that are real nuisances that create huge problems. This picture right here is um, uh, Lake Zor, and this is before an invasive aquatic plant problem. This is the same section of the lake after. And this was only, you know, a few years after. Um, and you can see that uh, covered with vegetation, there's actually plants that are rooted on the bottom here. This is what's called Eurasian water milfoil, which you'll be showing what it looks like in a bit, uh, with what's called an algal bloom on top of it. Algae is uh, another kind of a form of plant, but a um, uh, lower level plant that uh, often is in the water and you can get these mats forming uh, amongst the invasive species. Uh, well, why are these important? Well. They have what's called ecosystem impacts and economic impacts. Um, from the ecosystem impacts, we're talking about you know, their ability to displace native species, not only other native plants, but all those other organisms. They could be fish, they could be frogs, they could be insects or whatever that uh, need the native species in order to survive. And when they do this displacement, they also often create what's called a monoscan, meaning they crowd out the wide variety of diverse natives and in their place, they're so much more competitive because they have no natural enemies that they just take over and this, all of a sudden there's just one plant like that Eurasian water milk oil I showed you earlier. Uh, so this is how they can really alter a, an ecosystem. And it's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's an effect which goes you know, sort of throughout the system, not only plants, but into the, the wildlife and, and fish and all that. When we, get concern about these invasive plants, almost always it has to do with some kind of a economic impact, meaning uh, what, how is it affecting people? Not really affecting the ecosystem so much, but what is, why, why are people not happy? And they often 
not happy because they can't swim, they can't boat because these things are to the surface and clogging the, the, the water body. Uh, and when that occurs, often the property values in and around the, the lake are, are reduced, uh, hitting people in their pocketbooks. In some cases, not so much in Connecticut, when at least will there be interference with navigation, particularly commerce, that type of navigation. Certainly if you consider rowing your canoe through an area and you can't get through it well, uh, if you call that navigation, yeah, we'll see that in Connecticut. And there's tremendous cost, management costs, um, I estimated, and this was years ago, I'm sure it's higher now, in the billions of dollars per year to manage these things. Uh, and also, again, if you count in the, the, um, the, the, the cost of, you know, uh, the, the, that it, the decline in property values and all that, it even adds more to the equation. I have a little video here, um, which i am show you, uh, this is, uh, we're going to be talking about a plant called hydrilla, and uh, this is a plant that's pretty new to the state, at least in, uh, in, in a problematic uh, nature. Uh, and we've done a lot of work the last couple of years on the Connecticut River and its tributaries. And uh, I'm going to show you, this is a drone, some drone footage. This is all hydrilla here uh, on the Manabasset River. It goes into the Connecticut. And you can see what we're dealing with, um, with uh, it. Um, being a mono stand, meaning you don't see any other plants in here, all the way up and down this river with only a little area in the middle that um, has uh, no hydrilla, probably because boats have gone up it and, and there's also a fair amount of flow there. And, but other than that, you know, this is just blocked with this one plant and you can see the, the damage it's done to the ecosystem. Uh, Let's see here, uh, next one here. Uh, but when we talk about invasive plants, people often think, oh, you know, plants are bad. Plants, you know, any kind of plants are bad. And we have to reiterate that's not the case. Uh, plants are needed uh, in, the, um, in, the, uh, in the ecosystem. They provide habitat for fish. They protect the shoreline from erosion. They filter. Um, chemicals, nutrients, and everything out of the water. So they are very much needed. And, um, you know, and, and, and they also create food and have a habitat for wildlife. Uh, as I said, stabilize sediments, improve the water clarity by removing some nutrients and keeping sediments from um, making the water turbid. And remove, removing nutrients will create, help create, uh, help prevent algal blooms, the, the green algae we saw. Uh, and also they can help resist the invasion by natives, by invasive species. Often it's not enough, but certainly a good, healthy, diverse ecosystem is less likely to be invaded than a, um, uh, uh, say, a, a lake where the plants have been removed and you just have bare body. It tends to often get an invasion. So they can help resist invasion. Now, for Connecticut, and this is information that's been supplied by the Connecticut DEP, uh, there is a, a number that's out there of 20 to 40% of the coverage of what we call the littoral zone is optimal with plants. What this term littoral means is the zone where plants can grow, meaning they're not light limited, it's not too deep or whatever. So of that, if you can have about 20 to 40% coverage, you probably have one of your better fisheries. Not always the case, but you know some of that littoral zone should not be covered with plants, but at least 20 to 40 percent should. So it's important to realize that plants are important, uh, but an overabundance is a problem. The my program, I'm the lead in the invasive aquatic plant program here at the Ag Station, has been doing surveys of, of, of lakes and ponds in Connecticut for. Let's see, I guess we're into like our 16th year. We started in 2004, so maybe 17th year now. Uh, we have um, uh, boats and we have staff. Uh, Summer is my lead uh, uh, survey, uh, surveyor um, right now. And uh, we, we have usually a couple boats out all summer long on various lakes, ponds, and rivers. And we do these surveys for aquatic vegetation, which means you have to travel around the pond or the lake uh, in your boat and then record what you see. 
you know, uh, usually we have uh, either a, a map of the lake and colored pencils, or summer has now improved the system, so we have a tablet and a stylus that can give you the different colors, and you mark what you see, uh, what plants are where, uh, using color coding, uh, which uh, will be put in a legend uh, later on. And these maps are created, which are uploaded onto our website. And you can see all the different plants here. Here's a, a lake, um, Amos Lake in Preston, and it has a fair number, I don't know, it looks like maybe 20 plants. Uh, and uh, no invasive species here. So this would be a, you know, a lake that has a lot of diversity, a lot of different plants, not, most of them are not problematic. Uh, and probably would be considered a pretty healthy lake. Um, but that's not the way they all are. And if we look at, um, let's see, um, we look at, um, uh, that's gonna, uh, for, let, let me just talk about this slide. I'm gonna go to the next one and show the map of Connecticut. But people often say, well, how do these things get, how they got in the state? How do they move around? How do they move from lake to lake? And um, you know, a lot of it is through human movement, boat trailers, boating. Here's a trailer that comes out of a lake, you know, loaded with plants on the trailer. If they put the boat on and then take off and go to another lake and launch, these plants will be uh, inserted, or some of them at least, into the, the, the new location and where they can take hold. So movement by boating is certainly an issue, uh, trailering, that sort of thing, to move plants from place to place. Um, but most of the actual, the plants in Connecticut that are invasive, there were at one time uh, an aquarium plant. And we think that that has been a major um, a mode of entry into the state and into the country and into the ecosystems throughout the country uh, by people who get tired of their aquariums, they're growing live plants and fish. And they, they say, I'm tired of this, too much work. Uh, the best thing I can do is go dump this in a lake or a pond to set everything free. And uh, although it feels good not to kill anything, you often will insert an invasive species. And many, many of the invasive species we're going to talk about today have been, um, uh, have been used in the aquarium industry, uh, but are now banned. Uh, the state has banned these, I don't know, 15 years ago or so uh, with legislation that does not allow these to be sold anymore. Uh, water gardens, these are outdoor water gardens where people have put little ponds with little waterfalls and things and they put buy plants and put them in. Sometimes they escape. Uh, it could be a flooding situation, it goes into a stream or whatever, and these escape and they become a problem. Wildlife, ducks, geese, Canadian geese can move uh, plant parts. And some will be talking about these plants and what parts they are uh, that can move around when she uh, comes on in a little bit. This is the current map of the state of Connecticut showing all the lakes we've been to and all the ones that have one or more invasive species. So down here um, is the uh, invasive species list. Uh, that has a green check means that lake or pond did not have an invasive species. And if there's some sort of a symbol, it indicates which one it is. And you can see we mentioned Eurasian water milfoil is on my first slide. That's the most common one, um, this uh, bluish star here. And uh, uh, you can see that these blue stars are mainly in the western part of the state. Uh, and this plant loves, seems, loves the west. The water's a little more alkaline here. It seems to really like it. Uh, and then when you get to the western part of the state, excuse me, eastern, this is western, eastern part of the state, you will see a different type of milfoil, which likes more acidic conditions. These orange squares are variable milfoil. And you can see, you know, this is um, uh, where the plants are. Uh, you know, and the, some of these plants like hydrilla is only in three lakes, but we've now we found it in the entire stretch of the Connecticut River, um, which is not shown here. But uh, uh, we're very concerned about this southern plant. Most of these plants are southern type plants. So one can argue that climate change and warming of the, of the climate in uh, New England is uh, giving them a better opportunity to move into our state. So these are the plants, I believe there's 14 invasive species we found. And uh, right now, 56% of the lakes we've been to contain one or more non-native invasive species. So, you know, 56%, you know, is, is quite high. And we're, 
of the states of the New England states, we are, I believe, the highest by far of this percentage. You go to like Vermont and New Hampshire, this can be way down. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's nowhere near 56 percent. I'm going to turn it over now to Summer. Now, what, what the way this is going to work is she's going to talk about uh, how we identify the plants, the different ways they reproduce, and all that, which you should know. Again, all of that is in the guide if you want to look at it again. Uh, and Summer's going to talk about some of these um, uh, structures, how we how we um, identify these plants, and also show you some pictures of the plant problems throughout the state. So I'll turn it over to Summer. I'm gonna stop my sharing and uh, go ahead. Summer, you are muted. Unmute. Sorry, right, once I hit share screen, it wouldn't let me unmute. All right, can everyone hear me and see the presentation? Yep. Great. Um, all righty. Normally, I start off this section saying, don't panic, the quiz isn't graded. Um, that's at the end, but now there's just no quiz. So you really can just sit back and enjoy. Um, but we're going to start off with some plant terms. Uh, these really help me in the field. And when you're reading through the guide, uh, just make sense of the different things we use to identify the plants. So first we have a fragment, which is a piece of a plant that breaks off and grows uh, to form its own, own plant. And this is how a lot of the aquatic plants spread. So every time you have a big plant, if you chop it up with a boat propeller or with your hands while you're swimming, it can then grow another plant. And then the next one we have is a tuber, which is modified underground uh, stem for starch storage, like a potato is a tuber. Um, and this is uh, a way for plants to spread underground. And then we have turion, which is similar. It's a modified leaf bud that's on a stem or a shoot. You can see it in this picture here. And uh, it's another form of reproduction. Next slide is on uh, leaf terms. So first we have what's called a node and it's the point where leaves or branches attach to the stem. So if you see in this picture, you have this long stem and then the node is where the leaves meet it. And then we have three different ways that we describe how the leaves are organized on the stem. So you can have opposite, which means they're right across from each other. Alternate means that one leaf per node on different sides. So one be on the right side, then the left, and then the right working its way up the stem. And then we have world, which is when there's three or more leaves at the same node forming a ring-like arrangement, like seen here. So more leaf terms. Um, a leaflet is basically, I think of it as a mini leaf. And um, you can tell if it's a leaf or a leaflet based on whether it's coming directly off the stem or if there's what's called a petiole, which is the leaf stalk. So here we have a petiole and basically the stem of the leaf. And then we have these mini leaves or leaflets coming off of them. And then, or we could have a rosette, which is similar to world leaves, but it's a huge cluster that's around the stem at one point, And then the rest of the leaves along the stem are different. So you can see in this picture, this huge cluster of leaves, and then you have an opposite uh, leaf system after that. And then the last one is tooth or teeth, and they are sharp points along the edge of the leaf. And you can see here the spiky leaf, and that's often a key characteristic when we're identifying plants. Sometimes you can see it with the naked eye, but um, often we need a microscope or a hand lens to see them. Now I'm going to go through some of the plants, not all 14 that we have found in Connecticut, but just a few, and these are all in the guide. Um, most of these are the same pictures right from the guide, so you can flip through or scroll through on the online version and, and see the pages and their distribution in the state. So the first one we have is fanwort, Cabamba Caroliniana, and it is from the Carolinas, and it has this really bright green color. 
Um, you can see here in this picture and the leaves are opposite, which is key. And then here's where that petiole comes in. That's really important because there is a state listed species in Connecticut, um, water marigold, that is almost identical, very difficult to tell apart, but the key thing is it does not have a petiole. So where the fanwort leaves have this little leaf stalk, the water marigold does not. And that's an easy way to tell the difference. You can see these long petioles in the blown up image down here. This is a picture of fanwort in Lower Moodus Reservoir, and it is jam packed right to the surface. But you can see if uh, you have your eyes trained to the different aquatic plants that we have some other invasives here. This is variable milfoil, which I'll get to. And then we have some uh, utricularia over here. Um, so once you get used to the plants, you'll see the differences, but all of these white flowers are the fanwort flowers. The next plant we have is Brazilian waterweed, Agaria densa. As the name states, it is from Brazil and it's often uh, comes here through the aquarium trade. And it's because it's so pretty. It's like the fanwort, it's bright green and it has um, this white flower with three leaves. That's very important when you're identifying it. And four leaves to a whorl. I'll talk more about whorls in a minute. Here's a picture of it in full force. And as you can see, it's matted, it's to the surface. No one's gonna wanna swim through that. Uh, it's very, very aggressive. And uh, this plant was found in Fence Rock Lake. We found it in 2009 in just a small population here. You can see there's a little bit here. There's a few dots around the lake, this bright blue color. And then we tracked it as it spread throughout the years. 2010, there's a little bit more, 2011, 12, and finally 2013. This was uh, the year before we treated because it had just overtaken the lake. It, uh, and that's what these invasive plants do because they don't have the natural predators like the native plants and they are really great at outcompeting all the other plants and just, and just taking over a lake. Next one, hydrilla. Greg had mentioned it before, it's now in the Connecticut River um, and it is really good at invading. It is really good at its job. So it spreads through fragmentation, through turions here and through these winter buds and tubers. So it spreads pretty much any way you could imagine. Um, and it has five leaves to a whirl, which, whirl, which is really important. Uh, when you're identifying it, but we have found in the Connecticut River, this is a unique genotype of hydrilla and it can have uh, whorls of up to 12 instead of the normal five. Um, and we've published a paper on this, this new genotype of hydrilla in the Connecticut River. And just like that video before, we have another video of the Connecticut River with the hydrilla, so you can see this was Greg driving along with his boat and all of this to the surface is just hydrilla, just mats and mats of hydrilla. And it makes it really difficult uh, to get the boat through, it makes it difficult for the ducks to swim through it and it collects algae, it can be a real mess. And this is right by the uh, bridge that goes from Middletown to Portland, which you'll see in a minute. So another important thing about the guide is it has these pages for commonly confused species. So some of the invasives look really similar to our natives and uh, we have these keys to help you out. So these whorls are really important because the natives have three leaves to a whorl, native waterweed, um, Elodia, you guys might've used this in class uh, looking under a microscope. And then we have the agaria with four and then the hydrilla with five. So this page is in the guide and it's really important to know these characteristics, know the leaf terms, because that is gonna be an easy way for you to tell if it's a happy, nice little native or if it's a invasive. Next up is variable water milfoil, Myriophyllum heterophyllum. This one is very, the leaves are very densely packed along the stem and they're less than an inch apart, which is key. I, I think it looks like a raccoon tail. When you pull it out of the water, the leaves collapse. It has these really thick flowers. Um, and then it has four leaves to a whorl and they have a triangular leaf shape. It's kind of hard to tell, but compared to other plants, it's 
the leaf shape is triangular. Here's this poor guy, just nearly up to his head in the, and um, it can be very aggressive. And you can see in this picture, this propeller is just chopping it up and creating more and more fragments, which is gonna create more and more plants. And that's just going to exacerbate the problem. So you really wanna make sure that if you're boating or kayaking, that you're cleaning off your boat at the boat launch and you're not taking any plant parts with you uh, because you could spread it to another water body. Next up, we have another milfoil. This is Eurasian water milfoil, Myriophyllum spicatum. And these leaves are more spread out. There's an inch between the leaves and they have a more rectangular leaf shape. And that's an easier way to tell the difference uh, between the two milfoils. But they are both highly present in Connecticut and can uh, create a major problem. This one's also in the Connecticut River and it's in Candlewood Lake um, and many other lakes in the state. This is a picture of Candlewood Lake actually. And you can see this, all of this is Eurasian water milfoil with algae on top of it. Um, and it's not really fun. I would not want to swim in that. Um, and um, that's what it looks like when, when it takes over. So here we have, this is also in the guide, but we have the Eurasian water milfoil versus the variable water milfoil. And this lets you really see the differences between the two. So you have the leaves that are further apart with the Eurasian compared to the dense leaves on the variable. You have the triangular leaf shape versus the rectangular. And you have the greater than 12 leaflet pairs. Remember those mini leaves that are coming off of the leaf stem um, versus less than 11 pairs for the variable. And that's why these plants may look similar at first, but once you dig in and use your terms and figure out what these characteristics look like, you'll be able to tell the difference between the two. Next one is curly leaf pondweed, Potamogeton crispus. This is one of the invasive Potamogetons, but we do have many natives in, in the state that we find in lakes. And I think of it as of the lasagna plant because the leaves are very curly and look like lasagna noodles. Um, and that's how I, I tell the difference uh, between the other pond weeds. And it primarily uses turions to spread, which are these, these buds they form, and those will fall to the sediment and to create a new plant. Here you can see, I believe this is Crystal Lake. They had a pretty severe infestation of curly leaf pondweed and they have some lifeguards that are trying to pull it out and uh, it's a lot of work. The last plant I have is water chestnut, Traponatans. Um, this one is an annual, so it only spreads through these little nutlets here, but they are very spiky and you don't wanna step on them. But there, this is probably the most easiest invasive to identify because it has this rosette on the surface of the water and that makes it really easy to spot out. Um, compared to some of the other plants. Here it is in the Connecticut River in Selden Cove and you can see this large patch of water chestnut and even though it's an annual you may think that that's that's easier to control but if you let one plant grow it can produce 30 or more seeds and the seeds can be viable in the sediment for seven to ten years even so you could have an exponential problem on your hands when you let these go. So that's what I have for you now. And then I will turn it over to Greg. How's that? Yep, we can see a slide that says harvesting. Okay, All right. sorry about that little technical difficulty. Um, no worries. All right, uh, so summer is going over you know, how do you identify these things? Uh, for most of you, obviously at this age, it's, you know, you're not gonna be probably out identifying plants, but I think her, her discussion gives you an idea of what we do when we identify plants. Someday, if you may be, have an interest in this line of work, the types of things you may uh, have to know in order to do the, do the work. So the question often comes, okay, we have these, what do we do about it now? Uh, we mentioned the prevention, you know, to, you know, the issue of boat trailers and, you know, trying to check and clean your boats and make sure that, uh, you know, you don't have bringing things from, from lake to lake. 
but there's also other things we often um, think about when we're talking about plant control. And one of them is nutrient reduction. Now this is, when it comes to aquatic plants and even algae to, to some extent, get, sort of remedying a nutrient problem in a water body is sometimes difficult, but you can't not do it. And the reason it's difficult, oftentimes these nutrients get into the sediment and they kind of recycle, you know, plants will grow, they die back, go back to the sediment, release the nutrients into the sediment, and then next year it produces more plants. And it's hard to, to break that cycle without something drastic, like removing the sediment we're going to talk about in a minute. But with that being said, we always around water bodies want to try to prevent any excess nutrients from getting in the water body. And um, the way that is done is, I mean, first of all, you want to make sure septic systems are maintained. For those of you who don't know what a septic system is, houses can be on either a septic system or a sewer system. A sewer system would mean there's a pipe that comes out of your house, goes into a pipe along the road, and it goes to a sewage treatment plant somewhere. In that case, obviously, those nutrients may end up, say, in Long Island Sound or someplace if that plant is, um, is, is not... Uh, you know, preventing that, um, but it's not really going to affect the lake issue. Uh, but septic systems are a um, way that homes that are not on a sewer system get rid of the waste out of the, you know, the, the, from the sinks and the toilets and everything. They go into a, through some pipes and into the ground where they are in a, a system that usually allows it to distribute underground and then let the soil remove the nutrients. If these are not functioning properly, they're inadequate, you often get this green area of green grass over the septic system. There used to be a, when I was in school, a book called the Grass is Always Greener Over the Septic Tank, uh, or Septic System. But it's because the nutrients that are in the, the water coming out of the house, water and fertilize the grass and it turns green. And here, this is a stream going into a lake and you can see it, it turns green showing it's moving through the soil and gets into the water and then that'll you know get into the lake. And this is a, an issue with a lot of lakes in Connecticut where all the homes are on these septic systems. And over time, these septic systems get old, they don't work as well. Uh, and if they're not replaced, it gets worse and worse and nutrients enter the water and create the conditions that will grow plants and algae. Erosion is an issue. Uh, road construction, say, where you don't kind of use erosion control, any kind of road, you know, uh, any kind of disturbance to the land where it's not protected often goes roads downwards and where it's downhill normally some sort of water or river or lake or whatever and this adds nutrients as well as shallows the lake creating more zones of light uh, reaching the bottom where plants can grow. Fertilizing this is something which is everybody's uh, concerned about excess fertilizers whether it be from a lawn or from a garden or from a farm um, and you know, there are what we call best management practices for preventing fertilizer from getting into water bodies. And one of the main things you want to do, particularly with lawns, is make sure that fertilizer lands on the lawn. A lot of these what's called rotary spreaders will spit out petals, pellets of fertilizer large distances. And if you're going along a road or sidewalk or whatever, those pellets get on the road, get on the sidewalk, and with the first rain end up in a drain that often goes to a stream or a lake and that'll add fertilizer. So reducing nutrients is uh, an important means of watershed management. Um, it can prevent the lake from getting worse. Uh, it often does not do a lot if the lake is already bad. I mean, it can help a little, but not as much as you might think because those nutrients are in the sediment already and they're cycling back and forth. Another issue we're deals with, with, um, with aquatic weed management is you often will have commingled species with desirable native species. This is a, a little video here with an underwater camera. And this right here is what's called Brazilian waterweed. That's Brazilian waterweed. That's Brazilian water. All this other is native species that you don't want to control. It's a coontail or something like that, which are, you know, you need some of that. You don't want to get rid of it all. So how do you manage this situation where you know you, you're co you have commingled species and what you do with one could harm another. And this is something we're always taking into account. 
when determining a management practices and uh, you know anything you do can cause harm to natives that you don't want to harm and it's got to be taken into account. We're going to discuss this in a little bit a little more. Uh, it's also harvesting. Harvesting is a, a, a probably the oldest technique at all where you have weed problems is you simply harvest them. You pull them out, you take them away, put them in your boat, whatever, put them ashore and then you know dispose of them either by composting them or putting it up on the soil and let them decay or that sort of thing. And this can be done. I mean, here I am testing this underwater cutter. This is in Lake Quantipog, Guilford, uh, electric underwater cutter, cutting uh, plants. We will then, uh, they're in the rope roped in area and then they can be collected and, um, and disposed of. Any type of harvesting, whether it's just sort of hand harvesting or with a cutter or with even a machine, usually doesn't get any kind of the root system or any sort of the propagules in the sediment and it will come back. So it's sort of like cutting your lawn you know, they, it, your stuff usually grows back and, you know, it, it's good for beach areas. You may do it a couple times a year and, and alleviate a problem, but it usually is not a long-term solution. And in fact, there are not a lot of long-term solutions uh, out there as we go through that. This is another harvesting technique. This is hand removal. Um, uh, this is uh, one of my former uh, technicians and uh, we were diving, actually pulling, um, uh, what's called fan wart from an area where we had removed it with what's called the suction harvester a year before, but we missed some when you have to go back and pull it by hand and divers can often do this. And there's what's called um, uh, DASH, which is diver assisted suction harvesting or diver assisted harvesting that can be used to get rid of um, plants if they're not too dense. And usually new infestations are, this is suitable for small infestations and that sort of thing. Another uh, way of controlling small uh, weeds and invasive species in small areas is using these benthic barriers. Uh, these are basically mats that are weighted down. You can see these sort of um, uh, air crinkles, if you will, wet air, whatever you want to call it. These are actually sleeves that are weighted with a steel pipe called rebar. And this is then dragged out into the lake and then dropped uh, over potential weed beds. And we've done some work with these. And, um, and if you put these things on early, and you can see there's no leaves on the tree. So this would probably be in April and or um, early April-ish, mid-April. Uh, and we have left these on say Eurasian watermill foil beds for about one month. In other words, they can be removed. Um, uh, they can be removed in uh, around Memorial Day say. That's right, this is April 27th, so this is a late leave year. But, um, uh, you know, it, only a short time does cause really good control. It smother, it keeps the light out, could cause uh, some sort of chemical imbalance in the sediment due to the lack of oxygen or whatever that harms the root system. We found this works really well. It's, it's labor intensive to put them in and take them out, but they can be re reused from year to year. If you don't take them out, you just leave them like some people say, oh, just put them on the bottom and let them sit. Well, you get a mess. You get stuff growing on top of them. You got gases underneath that bubble them up. These do have vents, but they can get clogged over time. And if you leave them in, they do create an issue. Um, and that's a downfall, but they are effective. It's a non-chemical mean, means. They are not selective, which can be a problem. They kill everything that's under them usually. Uh, but for a beach area where you don't want much vegetation, that sort of thing, it, it, it can be effective. The other thing which is done, uh, it's done on the largest lake in Connecticut, Candlewood Lake, is lowering the water level. Now this is summer and this is a pond that was being dredged. I use this as an example, but um, uh, normally this is done in the winter where if you have a dam, you can lower the water level, going, letting it out an outlet under the dam. Hello? The dam. And, um, you can uh, uh, cause the plants to be controlled by usually in the wintertime anyway, they freezing, drying, you know, desiccating in some way. Um, and, you know, it can, it can be a very inexpensive way of controlling. You got to make sure that you, the water coming in will fill up the lake come spring pretty quickly or you're going to have a problem. Um, it is rather non-selective, meaning there's damage to other native desirable plants. And it also can have negative effects on things like frogs, turtles, uh, shoreline organisms that might be hibernating, thinking, ah, oh, great, I'm right next to my lake. 
um, it's sort of a wet area and then all of a sudden the lake goes down, you know, all of a sudden it's a dry area and that could be a problem. Uh, Kenwood Lake lowers the water level about 12 feet every other year. So it really does lower it. Even there where you lower it 12 feet, you do get good control in the year you do it, but normally these plants are not controlled deeper into the sediment I think due to um, you know, lack, of, lack of freezing, retention of moisture in the sediment, and often they, they will re-sprout. But in the year that you do it, the year is usually pretty, pretty effective. Dredging is another option, removing that sediment. I mentioned how sediment can act as a, as a sort of a, to cycle nutrients back in each year, even though you may have cleaned up the nutrients going in. One way to get to, to, to reduce that cycling is to get rid of the sediment by a dredging situation. Uh, there's many ways it can be dredged. They're all very expensive. It can be hundreds of thousands of dollars for, you know, 20 acres, 30 acres to actually bring machines in, get it out. You often have to store the muck so it dries in some way, sort of a retention area. So then it can be taken away. The muck doesn't really have much value. You usually can't sell the muck itself. Uh, there is what's called dry dredging, where you'll actually drain the lake through a drawdown or whatever, uh, and then get excavation bulldozers and everything, and then take the sediment out that way. It works great, but boy, difficult. It's expensive to get uh, get it going. Permits are needed through everybody, but from the deep D DEP to state DEP, from to the towns to the Army Corps of Engineers, sometimes and who knows who. Um, not often. This uh, dry dredging is, is, is easily accomplished. It comes, and then we get to the herbicides, the aquatic chemicals that are used. Now, there's a lot of these being used in the state, and it often creates uh, sort of a discontent amongst various people who live around the lake. Some people want them, some people don't want them, some people feel they're perfectly reasonable, other people feel it's polluting the water or harming their children that might be swimming in the water. All of these herbicides have to be. Uh, approved by the EPA, um, the, the, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and they have to go through very stringent safety tests. The state DEP will then look over that data as well and decide whether they want to allow it in the state. So anything that, any herbicide, any chemical that's used to control weeds um, in ponds and lakes and water bodies in the state has to be approved by both the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and once they're approved, you can't just go apply these things willy-nilly. You need to then go to the state DEP and your local town with a permit request that has to be reviewed in detail. And it takes months often to get, to get a reply back on whether you can then move forward that, um, that year with your treatments. So it is highly regulated. You can't just do it, uh, you know, at, at a spur of the moment, or you know, just because you, you know, you can, you think you can go to the garden center and buy a chemical and put it in your pot. That's that's not that's not going to happen. Um, so this is a granular product being applied to Basin Lake. Most products now are liquids that will be put in the water, and often they can be selective. For instance, this product is selective to milfoil and not a lot of native species, so it has that advantage. So there are some advantages to these. Uh, normally, they are not something you do once and just go walk away. It's something, again, that needs constant maintenance. And you know sometimes you can uh, at least eradicate an invasive species for a little while. Normally, it will come back. So this is you know, aquatic herbicides. Again, something which there's done on, I would say, probably maybe 100 lakes or ponds in the state at more will we'll apply something like this on a yearly basis. Now, one, a gold standard for control, if you could do it, is some sort of a biological organism, uh, particularly if you could find something that was, say, uh, in the native range of the invasive species. For instance, say, uh, a species came from uh, Asia, and you went to Asia, found it, found the species growing there, and found a lot, and, you, and oftentimes they're not a problem in their native range. They have natural uh, controls uh, uh, that, that keep them in check. There's sort of a, a, a system of you know, survival of the fittest and this and that, which causes the, 
the, uh, the, 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 the organisms that feed on the plant to be highly populated so no one plant can take over. So if you can find these organisms, bring them back potentially um, and somehow gene and test them to make sure they're not going to harm native species or anything, that they'll be just as effective here as they are there, that would be great. The problem is we have not found any of those yet, at least for anything in Connecticut. We did testing with a beetle called a milfoil weevil for years in Candlewood Lake and other lakes. This beetle is about the size of a, I don't know, maybe a little smaller than a Japanese beetle. This is way, way bigger than it normally is. And it looks big here, um, maybe a quarter inch in, in across. But we release these um, because we know they feed on milfoil but we could not get the population to build. There was, there, they seemed like the fish and other um, uh, organisms in the lake fed on them and uh, prevented them from creating the population level to do the control. So we had to give that up. So basically the only uh, control, uh, biological control in the state right now is these weed eating fish called grass carp. These are not what's called Asian carp, which you may have heard of that are in the Great Lakes or trying, you know, almost trying to get in the Great Lakes in the Mississippi, you say. These are uh, specialized carp. Uh, they're sterile when you, you have to buy them. They have to be permitted again through Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Um, but they are special fish. You buy them and they are sterile. They have an extra set of chromosomes that prevents them from uh, being fertile. So that you can put these in a pond or a lake and they will feed on vegetation and they will not multiply. So you, if you have a, particularly a smaller pond or a, you know, you can put a certain number in, usually it's like 15 per acre of uh, vegetated acre. Uh, they cost maybe $15 a piece. So it's expensive, but chemical applications can run into thousand dollars an acre or more. Once these are put in, they're usually put in very small or usually maybe a foot long or so. Um, and they have to grow. They don't do too much in the first year or two, but after that, they get bigger and bigger and they can get really big. I mean, this is a, I don't know, this could be a 25, 30 pound fish out of a small pond. So they get big and uh, they can, they, they will feed, they will feed you know, voraciously on, um, on, on vegetation. They are not particularly selective. They tend to love native species uh, and they often will remove everything if you put too much in, too many of them in. And it's a little dicey figuring out exactly how many you need. Oftentimes you put them in, nothing will happen for a lot of years and you'll say, I need more. And you get a permit to put more in. And then a few years later, every plant is gone in the lake. They've all been eaten and you got a lot of hungry fish. Uh, so it's been tricky. It's really tricky getting this right, but it is something that is used. Kenwood Lake, largest lake in the state has introduced over 5,000 of these in the last, um, uh, 10 years. And, um, you know, they're not much control. We, we surveyed every year that lake and we're not seeing much control in that particular lake, but we are seeing a lot of control in an upstream lake, like Zor. And we think that they have moved into the upstream lake and uh, there's no vegetation there anymore. So that's an issue. Again, nothing is perfect in this business. You're always, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know a, a situation where there's you know, pros and cons, and uh, you try to make sure there's more pros and cons when you move forward. So with that, I'm going to end here. I'm going to have our contact information, um, both myself and Summer, uh, our, our email addresses, our phone numbers, uh, the portal for our invasive aquatic plant program. Uh, if you go to this portal, you can get. Uh, uh, if you don't already have the invasive plant guide, you can get it there, but we've already sent you, I believe, a, uh, a link to it. Uh, but you can see everything we've done and I'll leave it here. Now, is there a means of asking questions at this point? Yep, so students can either unmute themselves and ask a question or they can write in the chat box. Okay, well, we'll stick around for a while. As long as there's questions, we'll, we'll answer them.
All right, so again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or write in the chat box, um, as well as if you have any questions for, oh, we have a question in the chat box. Susan Michael asks, who pays for the treatments? Very good question. As we said, treatments of any kind usually are not cheap. So there's various ways they get paid for. Um, it can, in small pond situations, it can be the homeowner or a couple of homeowners that pay for it. If it's a, a larger lake situation, there's sometimes lake associations that, that will fund it. The state of Connecticut has now a grant system set up where there's uh, a, a fee when people register their boats, I believe it's $5 for in-state um, boat owners, that goes to an invasive aquatic plant fund that at the end of each year gets distributed via grant applications. And we're just writing them in now um, for the, this will be the first year that the money's been available where the state can foot the bill for the treatments or for anything re that, that, that is associated with invasive aquatic plants. It could be uh, education seminars. Uh, it could be, um, you know, other things like, uh, you know, uh, oh, I mean, uh, boat launch monitoring surveys, uh, all that sort of thing can, can, can be funded through that. So that's going to be a program where there's going to be funding that the state is going to provide. And this is important because so many of the lakes and even the state lakes, state lake meaning that there's a boat launch ramp and anybody from the state can use it. It's a state water body, but the state didn't have any funding to maintain it. So the people who lived around it often were scrambling to put the bill to, 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 to protect the state lake. And obviously that was something they always complained about. Why should they do it when everybody else can enjoy it? But obviously they live on the lake, so it's important to them and they were doing it. So Funding can come from individuals, it can come from organizations, it can come from state agencies through uh, a grant program. Um, but there's a lot of need out there for funding that people just don't have it for projects. Um, Connecticut River, for instance, uh, there's so much hydrilla in the river and there is a quote of, I don't know, like $6 million to do a treatment of the river, assuming you could pull it off with all the logistical issues with a flowing water system. But um, so again, there is from a funding out there from private sector and government sector. It's not a lot, um, but that's how people fund this. And then we have another question. I'm not sure if you can see it, but David Morin says, are any of these local invasive aquatic species hardy to a zone three, example, Northern New England, as we are a zone five, six, can any run into a zone two? The answer is yes. There have been, even the plants we think like hydrilla, that is really a Southern plant. Um, it, and, and it's now, working its way through Connecticut North, but there has been populations found as far north as Maine, Canada. It's thought that a lot of these plants, even though they're Southern plants, you have to remember they are in the water. Water, even when it freezes, doesn't get much below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So these aquatic ecosystems are not super cold uh, and a lot of these plants can survive. So the answer to the question is yes, we think that most plants that are in Connecticut can actually survive in zone, you know, a lot lower zones than, than we are here, Canadian line or even further north. We have to assume that. All right, and then we have another question. Are there volunteer programs to monitor boat launches to prevent transfer of invasive? Minnesota trains volunteers and stations them at boat launches to make sure as boats are removed from the water body they are cleaned. Uh, well, the answer is yes to a small extent. The, uh, you know, private boat launch ramps, you know, some of the ramps are owned privately. They're not owned by the state. They're owned by maybe a town or by even a, an entity. It could be a, I don't know, it could be a, a, 
club or something, uh, Oak Club. Uh, and, and, you know, they can, they can, they can obviously have boat launch monitors there. And there are some, but a very few. The state of Connecticut does have some funding for some boat launch monitors at a few select lakes, a very few. We've seen them at uh, Candlewood Lake, um, biggest lake in the state often has one at one of the ramps. They're paid as a summer position. There's a few around, but not many. And compared to like other states like New York, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, where this is a big deal. They know that they got clean lakes and they don't want anybody else's invasive species coming in. Many, many will have either volunteer or paid boat launch monitors. Um, something that I think Connecticut's got to do a work harder at, and uh, but it does take, you know, it's, it's very hard to get reliable volunteers that you know will be there at a certain time and for a certain length of time uh, on certain days. So you usually have to go to the paid route and there's not a lot of money right now for that. So my guess is some of this state money from this boat registration sticker, the $5 will probably go to some of that. But yeah, we're behind a lot of states in that. We really are. And then she also asked, any thoughts been given to public service announcements to educate the public? Uh, yeah, and uh, that is done. I mean, we have um, press releases here. We had one on the hydrilla find that we had, uh, and, and we give workshops, you know, all over the state. Uh, I try to get the word out. We have our guide that's available, our website. But yeah, I mean, I think the state could do a better job. And a lot of that is, you know, not only Ag Station, but it's others, including Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, is to get the word out. Um, I have seen uh, one, I think it was two years ago, I actually saw a billboard here in New Haven uh, mentioning the fact that, you know, that you should be aware of invasive species. You should be practicing what's called clean, drain, and dry, which is a means of taking your boat, cleaning it, draining all the water out in case there's anything in the boat uh, itself. You sometimes water, boat, water bo bo boats have water in them and you need to pull a plug or whatever, get the water out of it. And, and that'll re cause the interior to dry better. When it dries, you tend to kill these plants. Um, so, you know, that is important, um, you know, uh, for, for, for that. And we have a question, is an invasive aquatic species designated so based on what may or may not have been here prior to the ice age? Well, that's a good question. I mean, that's a tricky one. <laughs> if you realize, hopefully people realize what the ice age really was. The ice age occurred between like 50, the last one anyway, there's been many in Connecticut, but the last one occurred somewhere in the area between 20 and 10 and 20,000 years ago. It, it was pretty much over 10,000 years ago here. At that point, don't forget, Connecticut was covered in ice. And the ice, we think the ice was about one mile thick over Connecticut. I mean, the end of the glacier of the last ice age was Long Island. That's how Long Island formed. It's what's called a terminal moraine and pushed up sand as the glacier ended its southward trek. But Connecticut was about a mile thick in ice. All that melted. During the melting, the entire landscape was basically sand, rubble, you know, too cold to grow anything initially, major runoff. Uh, causing, you know, the tills in the soil and all the striations, the striations of soil and, 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 and substrate. So anyways, after that, there was no plants during the ice age, obviously, we're ice. So everything was invasive after that. So you could claim that everything is invasive. Um, for the purposes of what we talk about, you know, anything that was here probably within the last, that was not here 100 years ago, and is now here we consider invasive. So where you go, how far you go back to, to determine invasiveness, you can, you can argue. Um, but I would say, you know, typically most invasive species we're talking about got here within the last hundred years. Oh, 
All right, any other questions? All right, well, thank you everybody for attending this webinar workshop. We are very thankful that you guys take time out of your already virtual or hybrid days to continue that on with our Envirothon workshops. Um, again, we will be sending out an email with some current issue information tomorrow, Friday, and a recap email with the links to these recorded presentations on Tuesday. And then we'll see you again for our February workshop week, which will be the first through the fourth. And feel free to use the contact information on the screen if you have any further info, um, questions for Greg or Summer. We also emailed out to you the ID plant guide um, a little bit before the presentation and also linked it in the chat earlier. You can also email um, the Connecticut Envirothon at gmail.com, ctenvirothon at gmail.com if you have any further questions. And Kelsey, if you would like to add one more thing, if you'd like. Oh, sure. Um, just wanted to give everyone a heads up. Um, what I'm going to be doing is monthly, I'm going to be releasing like practice questions based off of each webinar. So probably next week, I'll have posted under this month's tab some practice questions for um, this talk. So keep a lookout for that. And I'll do that for every uh, month moving forward too, so.